Hi there. Glad to have you joining us for the reading of the Oz books. We are currently reading The Land of Oz by L. Frank Baum, which is the second book in the series. And yesterday we read chapters 11 and 12, putting us halfway through the book. And yesterday what happened in the book was that the Scarecrow, Tip, Jack Pumpkinhead, and the Sawhorse made it to the land of the Winkies, where the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman were reunited as friends from the previous book, and the Scarecrow shares with his friend the Tin Woodman that his city has been taken over by General Ginger and her all-girl army of revolt. The Tin Woodman says that the friends need to go and reinstate the Scarecrow as the king of the Emerald City, and they start off on a journey to get there. Along the way, Mombi decides, at General Ginger's insistence, to put obstacles in their way. Along with those obstacles, they end up with a problem because the sawhorse accidentally breaks his leg. As they are deciding how to go ahead and fix the sawhorse's leg, they run into Mr. H.M. Wogglebug T.E. And that is actually where we will pick up the story here in Chapter 13. We pick up with the Wogglebug's story. So Chapter 13, A Highly Magnified History. It is but honest that I should acknowledge at the beginning of my recital that I was born an ordinary Wogglebug began the creature in a frank and friendly tone. Knowing no better, I used my arms as well as my legs for walking and crawled under the edges of stones or hid among the roots of the grass with no thought beyond finding a few insects smaller than myself to feed upon. The chill nights rendered me stiff and motionless, for I wore no clothing, but each morning the warm rays of the sun gave me new life and restored me to activity. A horrible existence is this, but you must remember, it is the regularly ordained existence of wogglebugs, as well as of many other tiny creatures that inhabit the earth. But destiny had singled me out, humble though I was, for a grander fate. One day I crawled near to a country schoolhouse, and my curiosity being excited by the monotonous hum of the students within, I made bold to enter and creep along a crack between two boards until I reached the far end, where, in front of a hearth of glowing embers, sat the master at his desk. No one noticed so small a creature as a wogglebug, and when I found that the hearth was even warmer and more comfortable than sunshine, I resolved to establish my future home beside it. So I found a charming nest between two bricks and hid myself therein for many, many months. Professor Know-it-all is, doubtless, the most famous scholar in the land of Oz, and after a few days I began to listen to the lectures and discourses he gave his pupils. Not one of them was more attentive than the humble, unnoticed Wogglebug, and I acquired in this way a fun fund of knowledge that I will myself confess is simply marvelous. This is why I place the T.E., thoroughly educated, upon my cards, for my greatest pride lies in the fact that the world cannot produce another Wogglebug with a tenth part of my own culture and erudition. I do not blame you, said the Scarecrow. Education is a thing to be proud of. I'm educated myself. The mess of brains given me by the great wizard is considered by all my friends to be unexcelled. Nevertheless, interrupted the tin woodman, a good heart is, I believe, much more desirable than education or brains. To me, said the sawhorse, a good leg is more desirable than either. Could seeds be considered in light of brains? inquired the pumpkin head abruptly. Keep quiet, demanded Kit, commanded Tip sternly. Very well, dear father, answered the obedient Jack. The wogglebug listened patiently, even respectfully, to these remarks, and then resumed his story. I must have lived fully three years in that secluded school hearth, he said, drinking thirstily of the ever-flowing fount of limpid knowledge before me. 
Quite poetical, commented the scarecrow, nodding his head approvingly. But one day, continued the bug, a marvelous circumstance occurred that altered my very existence and brought to my present pinnacle brought me to my present pinnacle of greatness. The professor discovered me in the act of crawling across the hearth, and before I could escape, he had caught me between his thumb and forefinger. My dear children, he said, I have captured a woggle bug, a very rare and interesting specimen. Do any of you know what a woggle bug is? No, they yelled in the scholars in chorus. Then, said the professor, I will get out my famous magnifying glass and throw the insect upon a screen in a highly magnified condition, that you may all study carefully its peculiar construction and become acquainted with its habits and manner of life. He then brought from the cupboard a most curious instrument, and before I could realize what had happened, I found myself thrown upon a screen in a highly magnified state, even as you behold me now. The students stood upon their school stools and craned their heads forward to get a better view of me, and two little girls jumped upon the sill of an open window where they could see more plainly. Behold, cried the professor in a loud voice, this highly magnified wogglebug is one of the most curious insects in existence. Being thoroughly educated and knowing what is required of a cultured gentleman, at this juncture I stood upright and placing my hand upon my bosom made a very polite bow. My action being unexpected must have startled them for one of the little girls perched upon the window sill gave a scream and fell backward out the window, drawing her companion with her as she disappeared. The professor uttered a cry of horror and rushed away through the door to see if the poor children were injured by the fall. The scholars followed after him in a wild mob, and I was left alone in the schoolroom, still in a highly magnified state, and free to do as I pleased. It immediately occurred to me that this was a good opportunity to escape. I was proud of my great size and realized that now I could safely travel anywhere in the world while my superior culture would make me a fit associate for the most learned person I might chance to meet. So while the professor picked the little girls, who were more frightened than hurt, off the ground, the pupils clustered around him closely, I calmly walked out of the schoolhouse, turned a corner, and escaped unnoticed to a grove of trees that stood near. Wonderful, exclaimed the pumpkin head admiringly. It was indeed, agreed the wogglebug. I have never ceased to congratulate myself for escaping while I was highly magnified, for even my excessive knowledge would have proved of little use to me had I remained a tiny, insignificant insect. I didn't know before, said Tip, looking at the wogglebug with a puzzled expression, that insects wore clothes. Nor do they in their natural state, returned the stranger. But in the course of my wanderings, I had the good fortune to save the ninth life of a tailor. Tailors having, like cats, nine lives, as you probably know. The fellow was exceedingly grateful, for he had lost that ninth, had he lost that ninth life, it would have been the end of him so he begged permission to furnish me with a stylish costume I now wear. It fits very nicely, doesn't it? The wogglebug stood up and turned himself around slowly that all might examine his person. He must have been a good tailor, said the scarecrow somewhat enviously. He was a good-hearted tailor at any rate, observed Nick Chopper. But where were you going when you met us? Tip asked the wogglebug. Nowhere in particular, was the reply although it is my intention soon to visit the Emerald City and arrange to give a course of lectures to select audiences on the advantages of magnification. We are bound for the Emerald City now, said the Tin Woodman, so if it pleases you to do so, you are welcome to travel in our company. The Wogglebug bowed with profound grace. It will give me great pleasure, he said, to accept your kind invitation for nowhere in the land of Oz could I hope to meet with so congenial a company. That is true, acknowledged the pumpkin head. We are quite as congenial as flies to honey. But pardon me if I seem inquisitive. Are you not all rather, um, rather unusual? asked the wogglebug, 
looking from one to the other with unconcealed interest? Not more so than yourself, answered the scarecrow. Everything in life is unusual until you get accustomed to it. What a rare philosophy, exclaimed the Wogglebug admiringly. Yes, my brains are working well today, admitted the scarecrow, an accent of pride in his voice. Then, if you are sufficiently rested and refreshed, let us bend our steps toward the Emerald City, suggested the magnified one. We can't, said Tip. The sawhorse has broken a leg, so he can't bend his steps, and there is no wood around to make him a new limb from, and we can't leave the horse behind because the pumpkin head is so stiff in his joints that he has to ride. How very unfortunate, cried the Wogglebug. Then he looked the party over carefully and said, If the pumpkin head is to ride, why not use one of his legs to make a leg for the horse that carries him? I judge that both are made of wood. Now that is what I call real cleverness, said the scarecrow approvingly. I wonder my brains did not think of that long ago. Get to work, my dear Nick, and fix the pumpkin head's leg to the sawhorse. Jack was not especially pleased with this idea, but he submitted to having his left leg amputated by the tin woodman and whittled down to fit the left leg of the sawhorse. Nor was the sawhorse especially pleased with the operation either, for he growled a good deal about being butchered, as he called it, and afterward declared that the new leg was a disgrace to a respectable sawhorse. I beg you to be more careful in your speech, said the pumpkin head sharply. Remember, if you please, that it is my leg you are abusing. I cannot forget it, retorted the sawhorse, for it is quite as flimsy as the rest of your person. Flimsy? Me, flimsy? cried Jack in a rage. How dare you call me flimsy? Because you are built as absurdly as a jumping jack, sneered the horse, rolling his naughty eyes in a vicious manner. Even your head won't stay straight, and you never can tell whether you are looking backwards or forward. Friends... I entreat you not to quarrel, pleaded the tin woodman anxiously. As a matter of fact, we are none of us above criticism, so let us bear with each other's faults. An excellent suggestion, said the Wogglebug approvingly. You must have an excellent heart, my metallic friend. I have, returned Nick, well pleased. My heart is quite the best part of me. But now, let us start upon our journey. They perched the one-legged pumpkin, head upon the sawhorse and tied him to his seat with cords so that he could not possibly fall off and then following the lead of the scarecrow they all advanced in the direction of the emerald city chapter 14 old mombi indulges in witchcraft they soon discovered that the sawhorse limped for his new leg was a trifle too long so they were obliged to halt while the tin woodman chopped it down with his axe after which the wooden steed placed, paced along more comfortably. But the sawhorse was not entirely satisfied, even yet. It was a shame that I broke my other leg, it growled. On the contrary, airily remarked the wogglebug, who was walking alongside. You consi should consider the accident most fortunate, for a horse is never much use until he has been broken. I beg your pardon, said Tip, rather provoked, for he felt a warm interest in both the sawhorse and his man Jack. But permit me to say that your joke is a poor one, and as old as it is poor. Still, it is a joke, declared the Wogglebug firmly, and a joke derived from a play upon words is considered among educated people to be eminently proper. What does that mean? inquired the pumpkin head stupidly. It means, my dear friend, explained the Wogglebug, that our language contains many words having double meaning, and that to pronounce a joke that allows both meanings of a certain word proves the joker a person of culture and refinement, who has, moreover, a thorough command of the language. I don't believe that, said Tip plainly. Anybody can make a pun. Not so, rejoined the Wogglebug stiffly. It requires education of a higher order. Are you educated, young sir? Not especially, admitted Tip. Then you cannot judge the matter. I myself am thoroughly educated, and I say that puns display genius. For instance, were I to ride upon this sawhorse, he would not only be an animal, he would become an equipage, for he would then be a horse and buggy. At this, the scarecrow gave a gasp, and the tin woodman stopped short and looked reproachfully at the wogglebug. At the same time, 
The sawhorse loudly snorted his derision, and even the pumpkin head put up his hand to hide the smile which, because it was carved on his face, he could not change to a frown. But the Wogglebug strutted along as if he had made some brilliant remark, and the scarecrow was obliged to say, I have heard, my dear friend, that a person can become over-educated, and although I have a high respect for brains, no matter how they may be arranged or classified, I begin to suspect that yours are slightly tangled. In any event, I must beg you to restrain your superior education while in our society. We are not very particular, added the Tin Woodman, and we are exceedingly kind-hearted. But if your superior culture gets leaky again, he did not complete the sentence, but he twirled his gleaming axe so carelessly that the Wogglebug looked frightened and shrank away to a safe distance. The others marched on in silence, and the highly magnified one, after a period of deep thought, said in a humble voice, I will endeavor to restrain myself. That is all we can expect, returned the Scarecrow pleasantly, and a good nature being thus happily restored to the party, they proceeded along their way. When they again stopped to allow Tip to rest, the boy being the only one that seemed to tire, the Tin Woodman noticed many small round holes in the grassy meadow. This must be a village of the field mice, he said to the Scarecrow. I wonder if my old friend the Queen of the Mice is in the neighborhood. If she is, she may be of great service to us, answered the Scarecrow, who was impressed by a sudden thought. See if you can call her, my dear Nick. So the Tin Woodman blew a shrill note upon a silver whistle that hung around his neck, and presently a tiny gray mouse popped from a near ho nearby hole and advanced fearlessly toward them. For the Tin Woodman had once saved her life, and the Queen of the Field Mice knew he was to be, he was to be trusted. "'Good day, Your Majesty,' said Nick, politely addressing the mouse. "'I trust you are enjoying good health.' "'Thank you. I am quite well,' answered the queen demurely, as she sat up and displayed the tiny golden crown upon her head. "'Can I do anything to assist my old friends?' "'You can, indeed,' replied the scarecrow eagerly. "'Let me, I entreat you, take a dozen of your subjects with me to the Emerald City.' "'Will they be injured in any way?' asked the queen doubtfully. "'I think not,' replied the scarecrow. "'I will carry them hidden in the straw which stuffs my body, "'and when I give them the signal by unbuttoning my jacket, "'they have only to rush out and scamper home again as fast as they can. "'By doing this, they will assist me to regain my throne, "'which the army of revolt has taken from me.' "'In that case,' said the queen, "'I will not refuse your request. "'Whether you, "'Whenever you are ready, I will call twelve of my most intelligent subjects.' "'I am ready now,' returned the Scarecrow. Then he lay flat upon the ground and unbuttoned his jacket, displaying the mass of straw which he was stuffed. The queen uttered a little piping call, and in an instant a dozen pretty field mice had emerged from their holes and stood before their ruler, awaiting their orders. What the queen said to them none of our travelers could understand, for it was in the mouse language, but the field mice obeyed without hesitation running one after another to the scarecrow and hiding themselves in the straw of his breast. When all of the twelve mice had thus concealed themselves, the scarecrow buttoned his jacket securely and then arose and thanked the queen for her kindness. One thing more you might do to serve us, suggested the tin woodman, and that is to run ahead and show us the way to the Emerald City, for some enemy is evidently trying to prevent us from reaching it. I will do that gladly, returned the queen. Are you ready? The tin woodman looked at Tip. I am rested, said the boy. Let us start. Then they resumed their journey, and the little gray queen of the field mice, running swiftly ahead, and then pausing until the travelers drew near, went away she would dart again. Without this unerring guide, the scarecrow and his comrades might never have gained the Emerald City, for there were many obstacles thrown in their way by the arts of old Mombi. Yet not one of the obstacles really existed. All were, cleverly all were cleverly contrived deceptions. For when they came to the banks of a rushing river that threatened to bar their way, the little queen kept steadily on, passing through the seeming flood in safety, and our travelers followed her without encountering a single drop of water. Again a high wall of granite towered high above their heads and opposed their advance. 
but the gray field mouse walked straight through it, and the others did the same, the wall melting into the mist as they passed it. Afterward, when they had stopped for a moment to allow Tip to rest, they saw forty roads branching off from their feet in forty different directions, and soon these forty roads began whirling around like the mighty wheel, first in one direction and then in the other, completely bewildering their vision. But the queen called for them to follow her and darted off in a straight line, and when they had gone a few paces, the whirling pathways vanished and were seen no more. Mombi's last trick was the most fearful of all. She sent a sheet of crackling flame rushing over the meadow to consume them, and for the first time the scarecrow became afraid and turned to fly. If that fire reaches me, I will be gone in no time, he said, trembling until his straw rattled. It's the most dangerous thing I've ever encountered. I'm off too, cried the sawhorse, turning and prancing with agitation, for my wood is so dry it would burn like kindling. Is fire dangerous to pumpkins? asked Jack fearfully. You'll be baked like a tart, and so will I, answered the wogglebug, getting down on all fours so he could run the faster. But the tin woodman, having no fear of fire, averted the stampede by a few sensible words. Look at the field mouse, he shouted. The fire does not burn her in the least. In fact, it is no fire at all, but only a deception. Indeed, to watch the little queen march calmly through the advancing flames restored the courage of every member to the, of the party, and they followed her without even being scorched. This is surely a most extraordinary adventure, said the Wogglebug, who was greatly amazed, for it is upsets all the natural laws that I heard Professor Know-it-all teach in the schoolhouse. Of course it does, said the Scarecrow wisely. All magic is unnatural. But I see, and for that reason, it is to be feared and avoided. But I see before us the gates of the Emerald City, so I imagine we now have now overcome all the magical obstacles that seem to oppose us. Indeed, the walls of the city were plainly visible, and the queen of the field mice, who had guided them so faithfully, came near to bid them goodbye. We are ve very grateful to your majesty for your kind assistance, said the tin woodman, bowing before the pretty creature. I am always pleased to be of service to my friends, answered the queen, and in a flash she had darted away upon her journey home. And that is the end of chapter 13, 14. And tomorrow you will find out what happens when our friends actually get into the Emerald City. So I hope you will tune in again tomorrow. I am enjoying this story. I hope you are also. And I hope you have a good day. And I will see you tomorrow.